Good morning children. Let's begin with our second chapter of history that is new kings and kingdoms. I hope you all are understanding what we are teaching you. If not, you can repeatedly see the videos. The videos are for your benefit so that you can repeatedly see them and understand the chapter. Okay, now this chapter is for your half yearlies. It won't be coming in your PT1 syllabus. I hope you all have got your PT1 syllabus. That is your one chapter of history, tracing changes through a thousand years and two chapters of civics. Chapter 1 on equality, chapter 2 role of government in health. So now we continue with the half yearly syllabus. That is new kings and kingdoms. Now. What were kingdoms? There were many kingdoms you've heard of. There were many dynasties. There were many empires that emerged in the continent. Some were Chahamanas, the Guptas. There were so many dynasties that were emerging in the subcontinent. Now, according to the time period, if we see, these dynasties were emerging and they wanted to uh, establish themselves as a big empire. Why? We all know that why the kings wanted to turn into a big empire, why they wanted to big build forts. So they wanted to show their power, their pomp to the other kings. They wanted to show how huge their empire is so that the other kings do not even dare to come and fight with them, do not dare to come and attack them. So let's begin with the chapter. Many new dynasties emerged after the 17th century. Map 1 shows the major ruling dynasty in different parts of the subcontinent between the 7th and the 12th century. The emergence of the new dynasties. Now which were these dynasties which were emerging in between the 7th and the 12th century? By the 7th century, there were big landlords or warrior chiefs in different regions of the subcontinent. Existing kings often acknowledged them as their subordinates or the samantas. They were expected to bring gifts for their kings or overlords, be present at their court and provide them with military support. So who were samantas? Samantas were people who were expected to support the king with military forces and they had to accompany the king in the courts or wherever the king went. You can say a type of a courtier who has to accompany the king wherever he goes. He has to provide the king with whatever and whenever he requires. As Samantha gained military, as Samantha gained power and wealth, they declared themselves to be Maha Samanthas. Now what happened? Slowly and steadily, these Samanthas, these lower courtiers or these subordinates they started gaining wealth from the kings because for every deed they did for the king they used to be gifted for that they used to get great amount of wealth for that now as they started gaining wealth and power because they were always with the king they were powerful also so as they started gaining power and wealth they started becoming more and more powerful and they termed themselves as maha samantas now Maha Mandaleshwar, the great lord of a circle or region, and so on. Sometimes they asserted their independence through from their overlord. Now they asserted their independence from their overlord means they started acting like kings. They started behaving like kings. One such instance was that of the Rashtrakutas in the Deccan. Initially, they were subordinate to the Chalukyas of Karnataka. In the mid-8th century, Dandi Durga, a Rashtrakuta chief overthrew his Chalukya overlord and performed a ritual called Hiranya Garab, literally the golden womb. When he, this ritual was performed with the help of Brahmans, it was thought to lead the rebirth of the sacrificer as the Kshatriya. Even he was not one by birth. Now, even if he was not a Kshatriya by birth, not a king by birth, he used to act as a Kshatriya or a king. Why? Because he was given such a lot of wealth and such a lot of power by the king. So Hirana Garab was the uh, ritual performed only by king. But he also performed this ritual because he had started acting like a king now. In other cases, men from enterprising families 
used their military skills to carve out kingdoms. For instance, the Kadamba Mayurish, Mayur Sharman and the Gujarat Pratihara Hari Chandra were Brahmans who gave up the traditional professions and took to arms successfully, establishing kingdoms in Karnataka and Rajasthan respectively. Now, these were people who were Brahmans by birth, but they gave up their tradition, they gave up their casteism and they turned into a Kshatriya. Why? Because they wanted power. They wanted to prove themselves as more and more powerful people of the empire. Administration in the kingdom. Many of these new kings adopted high surrounding titles such as Maharaja Dhiraj, Great King, Overlord of the Kings. Then it is Tribhuvan Chakravartin, Lord of Three Worlds and so on. However, in spite of such claims, they often shared power with their Samantas as well as with association of peasants, traders and Brahmans. In each of these states, resources were obtained from the producers. That is, peasants, cattle keepers, artisans who were often persuaded or compelled to surrender part of what they produced. Sometimes they were claimed as rent due to Lord who asserted that he owned the land. Revenue was also collected from the traders. Now what happened? A part of the wealth which a person used to earn, a part of his earnings he had to surrender to these Samantas or the Mahasamantas as a form of tribute. And the kings or these Mahasamantas used to term that as rent because these people were using the land in which they were working. So you can say it was a type of a rent which they were paying to the king as they were using the property, they were using the land of the so they had to pay a tribute to the king, a part of their income, which was forcefully or willingly taken from the people. Means they had to pay, whether willingly or not willingly. These resources were used to finance the king's establishment as well as for the construction of temples and forts. They were also used to fight wars, which were in turn expected to lead to the acquisition of wealth in the form of plunder and access to land as well as for trade routes. Now, the rent which was collected, the tribute which was collected, why was it collected? Where did that wealth go? That wealth used to go in the maintenance of the armies and during the time of warfare, that wealth was used to uh, give fooding and lodging to the armies. The functionaries for collecting revenue were generally recruited from influential families and positions were often hereditary. This was true about the army as well. In many cases, close relatives of the king held these positions. Now, the positions used to come hereditary, right? If the son of the king will always become a king. The son of a Brahman, a priest, will also become a priest. Only if they do not go against the rule and establish themselves as some different caste. Initially, we had studied that the posts were not hereditary. They were given according to the capability of a person. But here in this century, the people, the posts were hereditary, which was transferred to the people. And offered these, often these high posts were given to the relatives of the kings only, to the close relatives of the kings. He never used to go outside to see the capability. He only used to go within his relations to see the capability and used to give them the powers and the positions. Now, Prashastis and land grants. Prashastis contain detail that may not be literally true. But they tell us how rulers wanted to depict themselves as valiant, victorious warriors. For example, these were composed by learned Brahmans who occasionally helped in administration. Now, what was a Prashasti? Prashasti was written in the praise of a king. And by whom were they written? They were written by Brahmans because they were only the literate people that time. They were only the people who used to write. They were only the people who knew how to read and write. So they used to write these Prashasti in praise of their kings, the lords, in order to please the lords so that they got good gifts in return. And what were these gifts? These gifts were usually grants of land. They used to get pieces and pieces of land when the king was happy by reading his own Prashasti. These Prashasti used to tell about the king's uh, bravery, the wars that he fought and about the uh, richness that he acquired.
Kings often rewarded Brahmans by grants of land. They were recorded on copper plates which were given to those who received the land. Now these recordings like which land is given to whom, which Brahman were recorded on copper plates and they were kept as a record. Unusual for 12th century was a long Sanskrit poem containing the history of kings who ruled over Kashmir. It was composed by an author named Kalhana. He used a variety of sources including inscriptions, documents, eyewitness accounts and earlier histories. To write his account, unlike the writers of Prashasti, he was often critical about rulers and his policies. Now, there were some Brahmans who were brave enough to write about the criticism also, about the policies which were not working of the kings. So, this person, or this uh, Brahman who belonged to Kashmir, he wrote about the king's criticism policies also. He wrote about what he did not like about the king, how his policies were not working. Usually, Prashastis did not contain that. But yes, this person wrote about the king, the aspect of that also. Thank you, children. We leave the chapter here. The next will be continued in the next session. And prepare nicely for your PT1s. I hope you all have got your syllabus. So, next, we will continue in the next class. Stay safe and thank you very much.